Good morning and good afternoon again, everyone. We want to be uh, conscious of everyone's time today, and we're very excited to share uh, this project. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, this is Malia Villegas. I'm the director of the Policy Research Center at the National Congress of American Indians. And we are very excited today to share with you a webinar that we are calling Cultural Measures and State Data Profiles on Native Youth and Family. As we get started, I want to just go ahead and go through a few uh, quick slides. And I'm hoping that you can see my screen now, but just give you a little bit of an introduction into the GoToWebinar interface. Uh, many of you may already be familiar with this. Um, but we just want to share a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's web event. Uh, we're looking at an example of the interface that's made up of two parts. The viewer window on the left, which allows you to see everything the presenter will share on our screens, and the control panel at the right. With that control panel is how you can participate in today's event. So we're going to take a quick look at that. So by clicking on the orange arrow that you see, you can open and close your control panel. Open, close. From the view menu, you can also set the control panel not to auto hide when inactive if you prefer to keep it always open. The audio pane uh, panel provides audio information. By default, you have joined uh, the webinar via mic and speakers. Click Audio Setup to select your computer speaker or headset devices. If you prefer, as you see here, you can join the audio via telephone, which we do recommend by selecting Use Telephone. And the dial-in information will be displayed, including an audio pin. If you would like to ask any questions of today's presenters over the phone, you must enter your audio pin in order to have your line unmuted. During um, the presentation, you will have the ability to send questions to our webinar staff through the questions uh, panel. Simply type in your question and click Send. At the end of the presentation, we will have time for discussion um, to answer as many questions and engage with you uh, that we have time for. During the presentation, uh, we may ask you to answer a question by raising your hand. This option is located on the Grab tab. Um, you can also indicate that you have a question and would like your line unmuted by raising your hand. Um, the one of, as a final reminder, uh, today's webinar is being recorded, and everyone will receive an email within 24 hours with a link to view a recording of today's event. If you know of others who are not able to participate, we also will make that link available if you have them uh, contact us. All right, as uh, per our next, our agenda today, just to give you a quick overview where we're going, we're going to have some introductory remarks. I want to acknowledge that we have our partners, um, Jen Roundtree and Sarah Kostelik with the National Indian Child Welfare Association who are on, as well as our colleagues, uh, my colleagues at the National Congress of American Indians, Amber Ebarb, Sarah Kotalski, um, and uh, Carolyn Hornbuckle who participated and shaped these projects uh, on the phone. Um, but we're going to uh, do some quick introductory remarks, give you a sense of the overview um, in terms of the goals of the webinar. Then we're going to shift to the National Indian Child Welfare Association, who's going to take um, about half an hour to present the outcomes of their work on this project. And then we'll have about 15 minutes of discussion uh, regarding their presentation. And then we'll, we'll take on uh, the National Congress of American Indians will present um, some of our outcomes and, and work from this project and have about 15 minutes as well for discussion, and then finish up with an overarching conversation about where we might take this work uh, going forward. So by way of uh, introduction, we want to acknowledge our um, funders and our conveners and our hosts in this work, uh, the Annie Casey Foundation, for their wonderful partnership and support, um, and certainly the work around Kids Count, uh, which has brought us here uh, today. So I'm going to pass it over to Laura. Um, Spear, and I'm hoping we can give you permission to speak here. Amber, I'm hoping you can do that. Okay. I think I'm unmuted. Can you all hear me? Okay, yes. good. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Laura Spear at the Annie Casey Foundation. Thanks so much, Malia and 
Jen and Amber, everybody who's, who's been involved in this in this project. Um, I'm very happy. I'm, I'm not going to say much, just to say um, that we are very happy at the Casey Foundation to support this work. It really was um, um, sort of came out of our the the shortly after we released our race for results report um, a couple of years back in 2014. Um, be, besides illuminating the fact that using the data we had, it was very clear that um, Native kids were um, were lagging behind on many of the indicators that we tracked at the state level across the country and it had some of the biggest needs, but also that the data that we had for uh, American Indian kids in, in the country is really insufficient to really describe uh, what's going on, to be able to be used by leaders in the communities to, to make better decisions and to also to highlight the strengths and the assets that Native communities have and that their families have. So um, we, uh, were, we partnered with um, National Congress for American Indians and the Indian Child Welfare Association to to really to do a, a deep dive on this topic specifically, and to um, and to also to be able to be able to uh, bridge uh, to play a bridging role with folks like um, the organizations in the Kids Count Network in terms of accessing that data and uh, really being able to make it actionable and useful for the communities um, that are impacted. So, um, so that's that's what this this um, that this work was intended to do, and I think um, hopefully this will be useful. This is just sort of the the really an introduction today, and I know um, that um, there's there's a lot of um, amazing resources available through the National Congress of American Indians and the, the National Indian Child Welfare Association around uh, this this topic, and the folks who have been involved in this project have got um, quite a lot of knowledge. So. Uh, hoping that this can be a relationship that continues in the future. So I guess I'll turn it back over to Malia or somebody else. I don't yep. know. <laughs> okay, yep. great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for that and for your partnership. We are very excited and we continue to see so much um, applicability of this work. And so again, want to acknowledge you um, and uh, also Sandra Adela and the, and the foundation here. So some of our goals, um, as Laura uh, indicated here, are really to share with you some information about some of the outcomes um, of our project. And you'll, you'll hear throughout that there are kind of two components very much related um, to identifying um, really strength-based indicators and developing some resources around that. Because we do our work um, at NCI and NICWA is always to celebrate the strengths of our communities and to build from those strengths in order to generate meaningful outcomes. Um, as well as to use existing data uh, in new ways to try to highlight those strengths and to uh, identify policy and program intervention. And so while we are um, here to really present to you and share with you some of what we're learning and some of the different ways we're, we're working with information and data and communities, our goal on this webinar is really to, to solicit your feedback, people who are uh, stewards of uh, American Indian Alaska Native data, on youth and families, people who are familiar um, with our communities, uh, and people who have a demonstrated commitment um, to trying to, to leverage information resources for community benefit. So we really have left time to generate you know, your input and to get some feedback from you um, over the course of this webinar. And we appreciate you taking time out of your day to do this. So um, that's really where we're going. I want to give you a quick heads up before I turn it over to my colleague, Jen Roundtree at NICWA here. Um, about the discussion questions, just so you're thinking about these as you're listening to the presentations. And these are discussion questions uh, towards the end, but we certainly bring uh, speak to them in the discussion after Nicola's presentation and after ours. Um, so we want to know things like, did anything in these presentations surprise you? Is there anything new that you've heard or that you're taking away? Um, would you use these resources in your current work? We're very interested in the utility of some of these projects. Um, and we also want to know uh, what kinds of supports would you need in order to use these resources as we think about growing the work forward. And in that vein, what you would like to see come next. We have some ideas on that front, but we'd really like to think with you about how you might use these, what the supports you might need would be, and what would come next. Secondarily, we want to um, think with you if there's time about are there other needs 
in your work to improve uh, AIA and data and the use of data that you want to make us aware of as we think about uh, growing this work forward and to talk with you about who you understand are the users of this data. We've had very specific audiences in mind, including Kids Count Center directors, some of you who are on the phone and others, but we're really thinking about who the users are of the data and how we can equip um, different audiences through the use of data here. So that's just a, a bit of a sneak peek. So now I'm going to go ahead and uh, show my screen and share um, with you our presentation and hand it over to Jen Roundtree. Good morning or good afternoon everyone. My name is Jen Roundtree and it's a pleasure to be a part of this project and to be with you here today. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with NICWA, the National Indian Child Welfare Association, I just wanted to give you a quick uh, overview of, of the work that we do, uh, which is really centered on uh, supporting the well-being of American Indian and Alaska Native children and families. Uh, so these are, are just the, the major uh, program areas of our work that are identified here. Um, you know, we broadly uh, support uh, tribal community-based child welfare programs and children's mental health programs. Uh, for example, we are technical assistance providers to tribal grantees of SAMHSA Systems of Care program. Um, we do trainings around positive Indian parenting and around uh, ICWA. Um, and our research department, you know, really uh, supports effective policy making uh, for, for Native children and families and we support evaluation that approaches that reflect community values and community identified outcomes. Uh, next slide, please. So our uh, role in this project uh, is really revolves around building on um, the work that, that NICWA has has always been um, involved with, which is which is to say uh, we're very interested in what are the strength-based indicators of, of Native children's health and well-being. Um, and this is largely largely building on the work of Dr. Charlotte Goodluck, who who um, developed some publications uh, with the support of Casey Family Programs um, some years ago. So we really see this as a continuation of her uh, really amazing work. Um, so just to talk about what are strength-based indicators. So we we believe these are qualitatively different from deficit-based indicators that that focus on lack. Um, and measure things um, in their deficiency, uh, we, we feel it's very important to, to focus on positive development and resilience um, and you know, recognize that family and community-based resources are often overlooked in mainstream uh, measurements and in mainstream culture in general. Uh, for example, in, in many studies of, of child welfare, um, they have often focused on uh, single parent families uh, and the truth is, is that um, the interdependent nature of families in Indian country um, is often misunderstood. Um, I know, for example, I spoke with a tribal leader in New Mexico for a project last year and he explained to me, you know, the importance of, of aunts and uncles and grandparents and raising children and teaching them how to be um, you know, contributing members of the society, but that is often uh, misunderstood and overlooked um, by, by outsiders. Uh, and this was also to include non-economic factors that positively impact children's health and well-being. So next slide, please. So this is just a really, uh, I think, simple example of, you know, the difference between a strength-based and deficit-based indicator. Uh, you know, and, and as we were talking about this in some of our discussions, uh, it really got to the heart of, you know, when we approach these these things from one direction or another, it really, you know, um, has an impact on on what we see as as being a a, a method of of uh, helping or a mechanism of helping. Um, and just to, I recall uh, one program, Tribal Child Welfare Program Director, who said, you know, we, we can't always get to successful outcomes by only addressing what's not working. So, you know, in this 
in this area, um, you know, some of the reasons that kids drop out of school, these challenges uh, can only be addressed through finding what's working, what's working and focusing on what's working. So who's doing it well, how are they doing it, and how, how can our community do it too? Um, and I know in my work uh, in, in many uh, different communities around Indian country at this point, um, you know, uh, Native folks are, are kind of tired of hearing about what's wrong uh, with their communities. They're very, very aware of what challenges they face and their children face, and they're very interested in learning about what approaches are working for other communities and how can they adapt those approaches for them for themselves. And I'll just also mention that that education uh, was an area of interest that came out and out, out of our survey, and it was very broadly defined. And I found that really interesting. And we'll talk about that a little later. Next slide, please. So again, this is just to, to emphasize again the, the why why we're focusing on strength-based indicators uh, and the fact that you know tribal communities are often misunderstood and misrepresent, misrepresented. As I I gave a couple examples of that, um, you know, and we've we've had lots of feedback from Native youth how uh, they feel misrepresented um, to the broader culture, um, the perceptions of Indian country as being you know you know, poverty ridden and um, full of substance abusers and um, is, a, is a very limited and narrow view of what's going on in Indian country. And, you know, the Native youth are, are very motivated to uh, change the narrative. Uh, and so, you know, part, part of this work has to do with supporting them in, you know, how can we start changing the narrative uh, for Native youth. Next slide, please. So this uh, gives you an overview of, of the design of our project, which was a mixed methods project. Uh, we had four conversations with various stakeholders. Uh, so the first conversation we had was with Kids Count data center experts, and this included experts in states with um, you know, significant uh, American Indian populations, so Alaska, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Utah. Um, we had another conversation with Native elders and tribal leaders. Uh, that also included um, program leaders of social service programs, um, uh, Native youth educators. Uh, we had another conversation with Indian country data experts, and that was primarily Native uh, data experts, but also included some non-Native uh, data experts as well, researchers. Uh, and then finally, we also had a discussion with Native youth, and uh, admittedly, we, we could not round them up for a focus group, but we had a very lively discussion via Facebook that was uh, very effective and, and helpful. Uh, so we'll talk about some of those findings a little later as well. Uh, and then uh, for the, the quantitative portion of our project, we uh, compiled a survey with 414 participants, uh, which we administered at two uh, American Indian conferences last year, the first of which was our, our NICWA conference, our American Indian conference on child abuse and neglect, which was here in Portland last April. And uh, the second conference was the NCAI mid-year conference in St. Paul. Uh, so it is to say lots, lots of um, interest in, in this survey. Um, we have, you know, we had roughly a thousand people at our, our conference. Um, we were very happy with, with the, uh, the outcome of the survey participants. So, uh, next slide, please. So I'm, I'm not sharing with you the actual uh, survey. I'm happy to do that if anyone is interested, but I just wanted to give you a little background here on what the indicators were that we included on our survey. So where we started was we went to um, the peer review Review literature, and it was focused on peer reviewed literature that um, featured community defined health and well being indicators. So, this was research, primarily qualitative research that had been done in Indian country uh, and uh, throughout um, indigenous literature, actually. So, to include Native Hawaii, uh, Aboriginal Australia, uh, Maori communities in New Zealand. But these were all 
you know, primarily qualitative studies uh, with people in these communities around how they defined health and well-being for children and families. So this, this illustration here is called the relation or worldview, and this is uh, something that, that was um, really, I think, operationalized by our uh, founding um, director, Terry Cross, and it's based on traditional medicine wheel teachings, uh, but it's really about, um, you know, how, how uh, Native communities define health and well-being. Um, and, you know, just generally to say that it's not um, a deficit um, approach, it's not the absence of health, but it's rather a balance of these uh, different aspects um, and that all of these are needed. So you'll see there's, there's four quadrants, there's context, there's mind, body, and spirit. And these each play an important role in not only the individual's development, but the, uh, the family's well-being. Um, these can also be extended, of course, to, to the community. Um, we've also extended it in our work with, with organizations. So this also functions at an organizational level. Uh, but when we identified uh, the community health and well-being indicators, we went ahead and sorted those uh, into these quadrants. Uh, and I can show you, uh, let's see, on the next slide here, examples of what those actual indicators were and how they were sorted. So this uh, slide here shows you um, each of the quadrants. So we asked the participants to rate um, each of the indicators um, with one, you know, being the most important strength. So you'll see the outcomes of, of their rankings here. So just to define what some of these things are. So in the context area, uh, close connections, you know, signifies frequent contact with elders and extended family. Uh, interdependence is really, you know, the reliance on, on family members and community members to have uh, needs met. Uh, participation refers to uh, participation, participation in traditional activities and, and uh, spiritual practices. Um, involvement in community, that's really about, you know, being an active community member and uh, being a responsible uh, contributing member of, of the community. Um, and so in this area, we found that, that two, were, two uh, were very closely tied um, in terms of being considered most important in, this, in the context area, which were close connections and interdependence. Um, in, this, in the spirit quadrant, uh, we have, uh, you know, spirituality, which, you know, is defined by having a strong sense of spirituality and spiritual values. Uh, there was hope. Uh, which was uh, very important in, in um, envisioning the future, having an impact on the positive impact on the future. Uh, participation re refers to participation in spiritual or religious practices. And then, uh, let's see. And there was just, just, as you can see here, there wasn't a real clear um, winner <laughs> in terms of, of the differences between these, these indicators. Um, but there was, however, a very clear winner in the next quadrant, the mind quadrant, and that is uh, a sense, having a strong sense of identity and pride in their native heritage. And this is something that also came out in the, di the discussions uh, with stakeholders as well, which I'll share with you in a bit. Um, but just to, to identify some of these others here. So belonging was a sense of belonging to community, um, access to cultural teachings and traditional knowledge, and then, of course, exposure to native language. So identity was far and away the clear uh, in that category in terms of importance. Um, in the body quadrant, uh, we have basic needs or the ability to meet basic needs, housing security, healthy lifestyle, uh, you know, such as physical health and fitness, uh, access to services and health care, having a balanced and nutritious diet, and having access to traditional foods. Um, and this, this area showed the greatest 
uh, distinct rankings for both first and last place. The, the ability to make basic needs was the clear first choice for participants as well. And it's interesting that um, it received the same score, the highest score tying with, with cultural identity. Um, actually, let's go to the next slide, please. So again, you know, identity and pride in Native heritage and, Native heritage and the, the ability to meet basic needs being the, the, the clear winners uh, overall, the 18 uh, indicators that, that people ranked. Um, and I think it's important just to mention that, you know, in the context of the relational worldview, um, I think we tend not to think about basic needs exactly in the same terms as Maslow's hierarchy. I think the balance aspect is still really important to bear in mind here that, uh, and, and this survey uh, results reflect that, that identity is, is equally important. Um, it's, it's, everything does not hinge on ha having basic needs met, but at the same time, it, it is of absolute importance. Um, and I was just going to say, I'm, I'm happy to, to share additional literature with you. I know that, that cultural identity has been um, an area of interest at NICWA, and, and we do have um, some very interesting resources that, that link cultural identity to, to other associated outcomes, such as uh, reduced prevalence of suicide, uh, school success, lower alcohol and drug use, higher self-esteem, higher social function, better physical and better uh, psychological health. So if any, anyone is, is interested, I'm happy to share that additional literature with you. Um, and just also to add education, we, had, we allowed folks to, you know, we asked them, were there any indicators that were missing here? Uh, and education was the one that was most frequently uh, added far and away by our survey participants. And what was interesting about education was that it was defined very broadly. So it wasn't only, uh, it didn't only represent an important opportunity uh, for, for youth uh, in, their, in their own development and uh, in terms of, of um, professional development, but it was also framed in terms of understanding the impact of historical trauma on Native communities and, and having, a, having a sense of uh, social justice and understanding about um, the history of, of American, um, you know, government policy toward Native communities. So I thought, I thought that, was, that was really illuminating. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just uh, to share with you some of the, the uh, topics that came out of our discussions. Uh, so both in our, our discussions with Kids Count folks and Native data experts, you know, there was a lot of discussion around how um, without strength-based indicators, a complete picture or assessment isn't possible. It's only showing one side, and if we think of it in terms of the relational worldview model, um, many mainstream indicators are focused on um, the body quadrant, so you know, uh, poverty, you know, financial resources, health, um, physical health, but that, but that it only represents one quadrant um, and one area of, of need. Um, there were discussions across all adult groups that emphasize strength-based approaches and how they force practitioners and policymakers to recognize and support the positive things that are working in Native communities. So we, we talked about this a little bit earlier. You know, a lot of, of the, um, the practitioners, um, I'm thinking specifically of, of social service uh, folks that we spoke with, they said it's very easy to get bogged down in, in what's not working, but what's been effective for them is to focus on what are those those good outcomes, what are those cases, and what are, what's working for them, and how can that work for other clients? Uh, you know, and from the standpoint of, of policymakers, you know, this is about uh, what's uh, cost effective, well, you know, what, let's invest in, in what's demonstrated to be working in Native communities. Um, data experts describe challenges around the measurement of 
strength-based indicator. So, you know, and talking about the importance of cultural identity, particularly, you know, how, how exactly do you make that an indicator? Um, and so, you know, one of the things we discussed uh, were how cultural and spiritual activities, you know, are observable and, and in that sense measurable. Uh, you know, how uh, change in attitudes around cultural identity or, or community uh, sense of belonging can also be measured. Uh, so I think, um, you know, more discussion ar around those um, ideas and the challenges uh, is an important thing for us to, to have. Um, and also just to say that strength-based indicators are important for their scientific value. So these are critical elements uh, to the well-being of Native children and youth. So, uh, you know, it is uh, critical that, that we include all of these things. Uh, next slide, please. So, again, positive cultural identity was, was identified as, as a critical indicator of strength in, in both the survey and the discussion. Um, and I just wanted to share uh, a quote from, from a Native leader um, from, from one of our discussions. And, and he said, uh, having a positive Native cultural identity which connects Native youth to their family and the world around them is a source of strength and a touchstone for Native youth who may have been separated from their families. Uh, and he says, Cultural, culture is a big one that I see with youth. There's plenty of deficits but I've seen where it's really helped when you have all those deficits, which are in Indian country. It's the culture, the family, the connection that brings kids back. So it's our job to have something in place to help them because when they know what their, who their identity is, and oftentimes if they're placed in foster care, they're looking for that later on. So it's very important that culture gets considered. That worldview is one of the most important things with our Indian youth to help heal families, and the Indian youth will help families. Um, I think I botched the last part of that a little bit. I'm sorry, <laughs> but just to say, uh, it's you know, have, identity is really what connects um, children to families and connects children to all the rich resources that that families and communities have in Indian country. Um, so, uh, youth leadership, recreation, or community service were identified as ways that Native children and youth develop cultural identity. So there is a lot of sharing about, um, you know, the different uh, ways and means that 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 kids can learn about culture and identity. So we talked about culture camps, um, the various kinds of community service. Um, Native youth and their and this Facebook discussion that we had uh, a, a standout from from that uh, discussion was that they were very concerned about having a voice. They need they felt like they needed to be heard, and um, not only in in mainstream uh, audiences but also you know with to their own tribal councils that they were very motivated to affect change in their communities and they, they needed to have a voice and they needed to have a sense of agency to initiate those actions. So um, I think that's, that's really helpful in guiding our work as well. Uh, next slide, please. So these are, you know, some of the next steps that we, we'd like to enter. Um, our discussion today, so identifying what are those existing strengths-based data sources that we can use now, um, and how can we create templates for community-level strength-based data collection. Um, also, you know, adv advocacy around including strength-based indicators and data collection efforts and primary research. So, how how can we move this work forward? And I um, I wanted to ask Malia to talk a little bit about the first kids first. Uh, project, but I, but before I turn it over to her, I'd also like to mention there's. I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with a Native Hawaiian educational assessment called the Kahuakai. Am I saying that right, <laughs> Malia? Uh, but 
but it's, it translates to the journey. So they, they talk about an ongoing journey of Native Hawaiians towards defining a balanced, strength-based understanding of Hawaiian needs and successes. So it's similar um, in some ways to the relational worldview model. Their, their illustration is slightly different. It's, a, it's very beautiful. It's in the form of a plumeria or a flower with five petals. Uh, but the domains are um, the Native Hawaiian population, uh, material and economic well-being, social, emotional, and cultural well-being, physical well-being, and cognitive well-being. And each of these areas features uh, strength and progress over time. So it's really effective in, I think, demonstrating um, change over time and really helps contextualize and, and provide an explanation of some of the possible implications and impacts, uh, you know, for better or worse, um, you know, and, and a balanced sort of representation of, of these indicators. So, you know, not only featuring strengths uh, and, and, you know, positive progress over time, but also highlighting areas of concern. But I'd really, um, if anyone has not seen it, I'd, I'd be happy to link you to that resource as well. But Malia, I was hoping you could talk about next steps in, in terms of the, the First Kids First work. Sure, Jen, and I'll, I'll be brief here, but I think it's a, a really exciting partnership. Right around the time um, NICWA and NCAI entered into this uh, work with Annie E. Casey, we were launching a initiative called First Kids First, and it's a collaborative effort uh, between the National Congress of American Indians, National Indian Child Welfare Association, which Jen has uh, talked about today, as well as the National Indian Education Association, NIEA, uh, and the National Indian Health Board. So hopefully you'll hear kind of four domains of child welfare, uh, education, health, and then our area at NCI that we're um, looking to add value is around governance and how we support tribal governance um, to put first kids first. So it's an effort for us to come together collectively to leverage our different networks and, uh, and work to um, support communities highlighting what they're doing to center uh, the work of youth and families. And within that, a lot of the work that we've learned together um, through this project has informed um, an emerging area of that around data and measurement um, and looking at strengths and beginning to build across our areas um, of data work and to be more explicit about the kinds of data and information um, and, and indicator resources we want to promote um, across our organization. So we again want to acknowledge Annie Casey for really helping us begin to shape that. Um, and that's you know, where we're hoping to take some of this work that you've heard Nick was share and that we're about to share um, on the NCI uh, components of this project. Uh, but we have a um, children's agenda that we uh, launched uh, last October uh, in San Diego at NCI's um, annual conference. And it lists out some of the policy goals um, under uh, each of the domains of health and education, child welfare, and governance that we're committing ourselves to and our boards collectively have committed to. So those are a few resources that we'd be happy to share and get some information and think about how the Kids Count Network and, and the resources and others who are on the phone can help us really draw attention to how these data that we're all stewarding um, can inform policy change and then how we can learn um, back from the communities that are using these resources, how we can improve them um, to equip them further in the First Kids First efforts. All right, Jen, so was that, that pretty much the end, I think, of, of your presentation, yes? It is, and I, I just, you know, wanted to open it up if anyone has any questions, um, if they're there, I should perhaps offer to uh, send Malia, or send, if there is a listing of folks who are on the call, I'd be happy to send out uh, some of the, the resources that I mentioned. That would be great. And we will compose a kind of a concluding email to folks. Um, and I will note that there was one question already um, uh, typed into the question interface. Uh, by Lonnie Habrock, and she says, will this be put on KidsNet 
I missed the first part of this webinar and it's so good. And so we appreciate that great uh, encouragement there. Um, so if you are a participant, you will receive within 24 hours a link to the recording here. Um, so that will be available to you. And then we'd be happy to share it out. Um, uh, Lonnie, we could work with you if you're an administrator on KidsNet or, or find out how to get that out there. We're going to also be sharing it on NCAI's um, YouTube page and through some broadcasts that we send to, to tribal, um, uh, tribal partners as well. So yes, we will have a link and it will be available um, after the webinar. If others have questions, you can again um, raise your hand on your uh, interface or type it into the, we, if you raise your hand, we can unmute you, essentially, um, and you can ask it uh, directly of Jen, um, or you can type in your question into the, uh, to the box. Um, so we'll go ahead. We have about 15 minutes designated uh, for questions. And again, the things we wanted to just prime you to think about were, you know, was there anything surprising that you've heard in some of this presentation? How might you use some of the resources and information shared in your daily work? Are there other kinds of supports that you might need to be able to take this information and use it and apply it in what you're doing? Um, and what, some, what are some of the next steps you'd like to see come out of uh, this component of the project? Uh, hi, this is Laura. I, I just unmuted myself, and I, I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand here, but I thought I'd just start talking, and that would be okay. I actually have a question. Um, th this, I'm just curious about, in, in your research, how the strengths, the strengths-based research and the kind of the things that were most important to uh, the Native youth and Native community was the same or different than other groups, other kids of color especially? And whether or not that's something that you, whether or not the research, there's research on uh, other groups that you use or you drew, you drew from at all. You know, I can't, I can't really comment on how it, uh, how it compares to other groups of color, um, except to say that you know this, this was really um, broadly focused on indigenous communities, so not, not only American Indian communities. I mean, the, 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 re, the literature uh, review that we did, um, you know, we were very committed to identifying um, primary sources, so we were really I, focused on though that research that was, um, you know, the outcomes were not defined by the researcher or some other expert, but these were these were indicators or outcomes that were directly defined by community members. So um, because there isn't a lot of that research, you know, we were forced to to uh, broaden or you know cast a little wider net beyond uh, American Indian, Alaska Native to you know Maori, uh, Aboriginal, Australia Native, Hawaii. But I, I can't comment on how um, that compares to other communities of color. Um, I do know, you know, in some of the work that, that we've been doing here at NICLA with, with other um, culturally based nonprofit organizations, I think cultural identity, I mean, I, I, I can just speak to this anecdotally at this point, but I, I think that's also an important factor. Um, uh, I know for our, um, particularly uh, Latino um, partners that we work with. Um, but beyond that, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I can't really say at this point, but it would be interesting to look at. We have a couple of questions that have come in over the uh, question uh, line here. Terry uh, Haven asks, is there a way to include the Kids Count partners in your work with the tribe so we can begin to make connections in the tribal community? Mm -hmm. I think that's a great question, and I think that's you know I think we're trying uh, to figure out with all of you what what are the next steps in moving this work forward. And I don't I don't know if you want to comment on that, Malia, or um, sure, perhaps Sarah. 
And I'm also un unmuting you, Terry, in case you wanted to, to say any more about this. We just, I mean, this is Terry. We we would love to be able to um, create some, I mean, better data, um, include more data in our data books, and and really start looking at at some of the juvenile justice data that we that we would like to to start really expanding. And um, it's hard to make inroads into the Native American community. Um, mm -hmm unless you have an introduction, unless you have someone who introduces you and, and vouches for you, basically. And, and so it would be great to be able to work with somebody who um, may know the community better than, than I do, um, who understands right. all the intricacies, those kinds of things. Absolutely. And so I can tell you a couple of ways that we've thought about this, but it's great to hear, hear that interest, and, and we want to be uh, thinking with you about that. So at NCAI, the National Congress of American Indians, we've started what we're calling tribal data quarterly teleconferences. And they're open to anyone, um, and we have them quarterly, so as not to burden anybody who, you know, we know the busyness of everyone um, doing this great work. Um, and so we have about an hour and a half. We tried 60 minutes, and it turned out that that wasn't enough. Um, people had a lot that they wanted to connect around. So we open up our teleconference line for 90 minutes, you know, not expecting that everyone can, can dedicate that. Um, we've had two so far, and so I think that that's one way. And what we try to do is have about uh, 20 to 30 minutes of those teleconferences being um, presentations of innovative efforts that are happening uh, by tribal communities with tribal data, um, you know, to, to showcase some of the great work and, and to also invite some of our partners and our network to, to really begin to be known by each other uh, more in depth in terms of presenting their work. Um, and then we have that uh, hour um, of opportunity to engage with the, the presenters, but also with each other to hear about uh, priorities, about needs, and to talk about. Um, we try to have a, a specific focus each time because, as you know, you know, data is such a, a you know, broad field. It could be data quality. It could be indicators and measurement. It could be data management. We found that you know there's a real increasing desire to have these um, these specific conversations about aspects of data. Um, so that's one uh, uh, piece, and I'll be happy to include information on our upcoming um, uh, webinar in uh, March or a teleconference to invite you or your staff, anybody really, to participate in those. And our hope is on uh, not this one coming up, but the one uh, following um, to present this work. Um, so that would be a really neat opportunity to think with a few of you also to highlight any of the specific Kids Count um, centers or work or questions that have come um, from this to bring that to the group. So that's certainly one way. And I think, you know, in talking with any Casey at the uh, outset of this project and our partners with NICWA, you know, we've talked about creating a supplement, I think was the term, um, to the Kids Count, uh, you know, data work, you know, to, to you know, get a little deeper with the, the native data, and that's a big part about what we're sharing today, about what some aspects of that could look like. And, you know, our desire is then to, to share those with you, get feedback on, is this even useful? How could you use this? You know, not knowing more about your day-to-day, -day, though, as Kids Count Center directors and those in the network, we feel like there's um, some real potential um, to, to have this inform um, all of your current work in some, we think, some nuanced ways. So. Those are a couple of, of ways we hope. We also have our Tribal Leader Scholar Forum um, at NCAI, and that's a one day at our mid-year conference where um, we have researchers and tribe, tribal leaders come together to share uh, information. And our call for proposals is actually open right now through February 19th. It's going to be in Spokane, Washington uh, at the end of June, on June 28th, I believe, is our day. Um, and so we encourage, you know, folks who, who may want to work with us to present some of the work of the Kids Count Network. We certainly will be sharing um, some of this work uh, at our mid-year conference at NCI. So hopefully those are a few ideas. All right, and then we have one other question from James Jimenez. James, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Hopefully you can... James, are you there? Okay, if not, I'll go ahead and read your question. Are you aware of any funding sources available to help support 
the development of strengths-based indicators in individual states? Are you aware of any funding sources available to help support the development of strengths-based indicators in individual states? I am not, <laughs> but I think that it's very safe to say that that is absolutely one of our, our next steps in trying to move this work forward. I know um, we, oops, I'm sorry, my phone got cut off for a second there. Um, I think that's one of the questions that, that we have uh, too and how um, we can further support this work. I know uh, in one conversation that we had with our data center experts, we, we talked about um, the Search Institute and, and how that work has been funded and looking at some other uh, similar, uh, not, you know, not quite the same, but other strength-based approaches uh, on how they have been supported and been successfully uh, used in various communities. So I think that's another way of trying to approach support for this work. And I would just add that my mind, I don't know of anything specific, but my mind goes to looking at a few of the states, um, and I'm thinking most specifically around American Indian Alaska Native um, resources, because that's what we're most familiar with. But uh, here in Washington State, um, they have uh, generated a curriculum called uh, Since Time Immemorial. And that was funded and really prioritized um, by virtue of the state legislature um, identifying you know, the need for students here in the state to, um, to know about Native history. And uh, then the collaborative that came together to develop that you know, really tried to emphasize strength-based work. Uh, I know that there's an effort to evaluate some of that that now is moving into this conversation about indicators and, and measurement. Uh, but that's one that comes to mind. And then in Montana, the Indian Education for All initiative, again, I think being pushed uh, by the state board there, being you know legislature, very involved. And uh, so a lot of these we found um, the efforts around strength base come from uh, a lot a lot of times the education realm and the focus on kind of mm -hmm. curriculum. And we know there have been a number of legislatures who've been considering, like California recently passed a. Um, kind of anti-stereotype um, uh, mascot uh, bill, and we're hoping that that will inform some of these curriculum and, and strengths-based conversations. So just, you know, just a few quick examples of, of how some related conversations can then inform and set some of these out as state statewide priorities. Um, the National Conference on State Legislatures, NCSL, has a uh, Native American caucus, so um, a caucus of American Indian Alaska Native legislators at the state level who've also been very active in, in promoting some of these um, curriculum-based and education efforts. Um, and so I think also to your first question, Laura, um, we've looked at some of the efforts of the Black Caucus there and, and other communities to find out if there are ways that some of these uh, things reflect or converge um, with, with other communities that way. Right, well, I think we're at just about time. Jen, I just want to say thank you so much. Is there any kind of concluding comments um, before we shift over to our presentation? Obviously, you know, you're, <laughs> we'll, we'll bring you back in for the overarching discussion here in a few minutes. No, I just wanted to say thanks, everyone, for being a participant today. I'm anxious to hear uh, more about your thoughts as we continue our discussion. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jen, and thank you, everybody. All right, and so we're going to just go ahead and finish up with um, a, about a half an hour presentation from us on the other component. Uh, again, this is Malia Villegas with the uh, Policy Research Center at the National Congress of American Indians. And our presentation we've titled uh, Profiling Data on Native Families and Youth. So where uh, Jen and the team at NICWA um, was really looking at this question of strength and how to build and what needed to be prioritized we were working with existing data, uh, largely federal and agency and state data, to try to figure out if we could develop um, a new way of using this data to, to share a storyline of the realities that Native youth and families are, um, are dealing with, to highlight strengths, and to identify some uh, policy and program interventions. 
So I really would love for you folks to think with us, acknowledging uh, our colleagues who contributed to this, Amber Ebarb, Carolyn Hornbuckle, Sarah Patolsky, and myself. Um, so going to the next slide here, in terms of an overview, some of the things that we uh, wanted to emphasize in this presentation are really using data to understand uh, native families. So families as more of the unit of um, analysis here. A lot of times in uh, policy and, um, and program interventions, what we find is it's an individual focus. Um, we're constantly pushing, I think, on the advocacy side to uh, look at the impact of systems on individuals. And we find that families um, really do sit at the interface between the individual and the system. So we're trying to develop data resources and analyses that help us understand what's going on in a more collective group uh, beyond just the individual. So just that to keep in mind. Um, also, our board at NCAI has really um, encouraged us to, we, we are a national center, so a lot of our data work uh, to date has really focused on uh, national trends. And I know that's, um, you know that's something that you folks have put out there, but obviously with Kids Count Data Centers being at the state level, um, increasingly our board has said to us there's really important different uh, differences at a regional level and at a state level um, that we would like better, uh, more assistance in using data to get at. Uh, and you know the importance of place and history and context, as you all know, really informs what's going on for youth and families. So our challenge then was to try to disaggregate, to really review existing data, and to try to understand what's available at a state level, so the state of Alaska, for instance, but then also for disaggregating by uh, American Indian and Alaska Native. We found very quickly that while the data may be available um, or produced or collected in that way, it's often not reported um, to both of those levels of disaggregation. And so out of some of this work, we have some um, recommendations uh, for federal agencies who we work with about priorities, uh, things that we need to be disaggregated to be able to enable this sort of analysis. Um, so I'd love to think with you folks about uh, any challenges that you see in some of the federal data and disaggregation. Also, what you're going to hear, a priority of the Policy Research Center has been what we call native to native comparisons. A lot of times in the, the research, Nationally, you'll see native compared to non-native, um, and that's what we might call the gap-based uh, analysis. And that's important for uh, understanding system disparities. Um, but we find that it, it often, that's where the story ends in a lot of federal policy and, and discussions. And in order to get to the strengths-based discussion, we really are trying to prioritize what we know about native families in one state, for instance, compared to another state so that we can identify where there might be better supports for natives that can be leveraged and learned from and built from. So it's a both and here, native to native as well as native to all others, um, so that we can get a sense of where the strengths and the challenges lie. What we're presenting today and as part of this project um, are four what we might call lenses into uh, how native families are, um, are faring. And so um, as opposed to looking at an indicator like um, poverty on its own, um, you know, children living in poverty, for instance, we wanted to compile um, a set of existing indicators to tell a, a broader story about family economic capability. What do we know about how Native families are doing in terms of their economic base, giving, given existing data? How can we bring together information in a way that can then inform what we know and understand um, to inform our decision making in different ways. So that's one lens. We also, um, certainly taking uh, our lead from um, reports like race, uh, race results, thinking about uh, access. What do we know from the data that we can pull together um, and tell a story about Native families and their access to opportunity that can inform how our work and our supports for them uh, might emerge? System involvement. So this is a hugely important area as well, um, not just looking at um, you know, the rates of um, incarceration, uh, but looking at system involvement from foster care to adoption to a range of arenas. This is a critical piece if we're trying to understand what's going on for Native youth and their families um, and how system involved they are. So telling that story, somebody asked earlier about the juvenile justice component, and that certainly is that lens. 
And then our fourth is child health and wellness. What do we know uh, there? Due to, to, due to time uh, constraints, we're really only going to share some insights from the first three today. Um, but we, our, our project will have um, all four. And then, as I said, we've got a state focus. So the, we selected four. Typically, we work with uh, the 10 states that have um, high state populations. Um, you know, just given where we're at, we wanted to really delve deeply into four, and we selected Alaska. Alaska has the highest uh, proportion um, of uh, youth, native youth, in, in, as far as the statewide population, um, and also the largest number of uh, tribes. Out of 567, uh, Alaska has 229, and so we thought, you know, we really needed to look there. Montana. Um, thinking about a different region, some of the different uh, challenges and, and strengths uh, that might come from Montana, New Mexico, certainly our southwest um, state, and then Oklahoma. Um, in a lot of the data going in, um, uh, we've uh, constantly been pointed to Oklahoma and youth and families doing well there. And we really wanted to include Oklahoma to see if we could delve a little bit more deeply into what might be um, working well, or if there are other challenges that are getting obscured in some of that data. So that's just a quick overview there. Um, just to say that you know this is not any of this analysis doesn't come out of thin air. It's really inspired by, and we drew extensively from um, both existing data and existing reports. We want to obviously give a, a huge nod to the Race for Results Index. Uh, many of you are very familiar with these, and you know we had really uh, rich conversations about how the effort to really flip the conversation um, about from a deficit one to a more strengths-based one, even in how um, you folks chose to report and design uh, the reporting here within the index. Children who live in two-parent families you know, is different from children in single-parent households. Children who live in families with incomes that are above 200% of poverty, um, really trying to get at some of the strengths-based. So that was inspiring for us. And then we looked at reports, a range of reports. I just highlighted a couple here um, for your reference. The status and trends in the education of racial and ethnic groups in the US. Very useful report, both in terms of how they're looking across racial and ethnic groups and how they're displaying um, often very complex data. But some of the indicators that they've selected we found were really helpful in thinking about all that goes into um, some of these profiles. And then we wanted to let you know that this work also builds on uh, work that we launched a couple of years ago um, called the NCAI Regional Profiles. We have 12 regions um, made up of states that we uh, focus in on. And so you can go to this link um, to find a series of profiles. Um, some of the data that we'll be presenting today has built on these. Um, but we really are encouraging our tribal partners to engage with us around some of these regional profiles. What can we learn? that's working in, you know, looking at Washington, Oregon, and Idaho as the Northwest region? Are there things working for Native youth and families in the state of Washington that can be shared across to Oregon and similarly to Idaho? How can we hold governors in those states accountable um, by sharing out regional comparisons? So that's some of the data work and data use um, that we want to enable with this. So going a little bit into a few of the lenses here. Um, to give you a sense of what we brought together for family economic capability. These are some of the indicators. Uh, median family income, uh, children in poverty, what's that proportion beyond just the family income to looking at our youth and, and their living in poverty. Uh, employment statistics, and we have a couple of different ways of going uh, looking at that. Those statistics can be really challenged and um, uh, not necessarily representative of what's, of what's going on in some uh, tribal communities. So just to mention that, um, you know, even though we're working with this existing data, uh, we are working in other projects to um, help to develop measures of joblessness, for instance, um, which for us is a better measure um, in many of our communities that do not have um, jobs. You know, and people may be willing to seek employment, but um, traditional employment um, and unemployment measures aren't always serving and reflecting our needs. So I just want to make that quick point. We looked at home ownership, right? It's not just about do you have a job and what your income in is. What is your capital? What does that look like? Um, in addition to that, even if you do own a home, um, what is that infrastructure? And we'll show you some statistics or some uh, graphs here about why we think that's important. Relatedly, how many other people are living in that home? That goes into to informing families' economic capability. Households receive
achieving SNAP, um, so really food capability here. What, what does that look like? What kind of food assistance um, is happening for Native uh, youth and families in different states? And also family composition. This was one we struggled a little bit with where to place um, home ownership also uh, in terms of is this more of an indicator of access to opportunity? Should we have it in both places? Um, family composition, you know, looking at who's, um, who's the head of household, are two parents uh, involved, um, and also for us, grandparents are huge. We, we knew and we um, tried to gauge uh, more in this reporting to bring that in so that, again, it's not just about um, our kids living in poverty, but you know, what kind of access do they have to intergenerational resources like grandparents that we want to emphasize and talk about that being uh, a part of their capability and, and the economy that comes into the home here. So just a couple of quick uh, snapshots. Um, the housing tenure, uh, kind of that home ownership piece. This comes from the Alaska um, data. And so you can see from the census, we've got an owner on the white uh, head of household on the left, owned in the dark blue with mortgage or a loan, about 47.6. Um, and then owned free and clear 19.3. Stands in pretty stark contrast to the American Indian Alaska Native uh, head of house here. Uh, just about half, 24.6 at the owner level and then 32.5, interestingly, um, the owned free and clear. So there may be some things that we could look at um, on that front in terms of that home ownership. And, but you do have the higher rental uh, rate uh, still going on here. The other piece that we've got um, here uh, has to do with geography and uh, looking at um, Alaska Native uh, village statistical areas. So does that have a difference? And you can see, yes, it's um, even lower owned with mortgage or loan, but higher owned free and clear um, and, and kind of in the mid-range of the, the rental market here. So taking some of these data, looking at both the gap and how this compares to housing tenure in states like um, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and uh, Montana to see if they're, you know, uh, American Indian Alaska Native families are doing better or struggling in comparison there um, and what we can learn. Some of the other data points, again, from Alaska here, we're going deep. Um, households lacking plumbing, kitchen, and telephone. And you see pretty stark gaps when it comes to the white uh, head of household compared to American Indian Alaska Native. Um, but then really interesting um, range when you look at some of the geographies, the urban um, versus rural, pretty significant uh, infrastructure challenges ongoing, um, and then some of the Alaska Native Village statistical areas. And so these, you know, we hope can help inform where policy interventions are needed. Um, you know, to, to just look at income and employment doesn't get at necessarily some of the other challenges facing um, families and their, and their economic capability and the challenges that they're up against at building some of that. And then again, also the occupants per room. This is one, you know, I think it's important to be careful with the analysis around extended family is a, often a very important part of culture um, and, and community uh, structures. Um, and so here, you know, you don't see it framed as overcrowding, although we uh, put that term earlier on just to pick up on a bit of the tension in how you tell the story. Um, certainly if the infrastructure isn't allowing for large and extended families to live together, that's something to look at. But just you know, by virtue of having um, large families, that shouldn't be something you know, that, gets, that gets taken away from. But we, you know, again, how you use the data to, to inform what's going on for families and communities is important here. So those were a few you know, that we just wanted to showcase some um, some data displays and some of what we're um, thinking and building towards with family economic capability. We're also, you'll see um, coming up here, just the different data sources. Largely this um, lens was built through using uh, census data. We try to use five-year um, uh, data where it's available. Um, sometimes it's the one-year data um, that comes through. But we just wanted to show that there's a lot you can do with this data and bring it together uh, to, to tell a particular story and to understand in different ways what's going on for families, um, American Indian Alaska Native families. The second lens, um, we've got a little bit of a different kind of data display here, um, access to opportunity. This is one you could think about as, as largely education, um, but there are other indicators that we're proposing 
to include here. So we've got things like educational attainment. What do we know? Um, so one of the things that we've learned here is Native people over 25, that's a good measure, in New Mexico experience the greatest disparity across the four states we looked at in having a bachelor's degree or higher. Those in Alaska experience the greatest disparity in having less than a high school diploma. Uh, one of the data points, though, is that in Alaska we found um, while a high school uh, diploma is, um, there's a less, uh, there's a greater disparity there, we're finding a lot of um, uh, American Indians and Alaska Native going for an alternative uh, degree, so GED is very high um, there. And so a lot of times the story is persistence and, you know, Native people may not be invested in education, but if you push down in the data, you can begin to see um, that there's different kinds of, of disparities and, and strengths um, here. So what could we learn, you know, from New Mexico, for instance, to leverage on the lower end of educational attainment? Um, and similarly, in Alaska, what could we leverage back around supporting people through to bachelor's degree and higher? Um, student achievement. So this is another element of access to opportunity in Montana. What we found was that Native youth experienced the greatest disparity in proficiency in fourth and eighth grade reading and math, while those in Oklahoma, again, we were kind of expecting this experience, very little disparity, except in eighth grade math. So, you know, Oklahoma wants to pat, pat themselves on the back. We, you know, we've identified through some of this analysis a few areas that are pretty critical, eighth grade math, thinking about preparation for high school graduation and for uh, college, that's an area. Um, that it would be important for them to focus um, some of their policy and programs around. Dropout and graduation. Montana youth experience the greatest disparity in dropout and graduation, while those in Oklahoma experience very little disparity. So what can we learn uh, from Oklahoma that we could leverage over to Montana in this native to native um, comparison, comparison here, but also what needs to happen differently in Montana for native youth? Um, who are really um, experiencing that disparity when compared to non-native uh, youth in the state. Computer and internet access, not just an education uh, lens here. This is about access to opportunity, and we think that um, data and information and, and computer and internet are a big part of that, and that data is available. So what we found is that native people in New Mexico have the greatest disparity in access to a computer and the internet, where in Oklahoma, the um, least in access to a computer in Alaska was the least in access to the internet. Um, the least disparity, uh, it should say there. Um, so that may be part of the story about where Oklahoma is supporting Native youth and families in a different way that we could learn that they have better connectivity. Um, and also Alaska, I was, I was surprised but encouraged in terms of the, the access to the internet there. Another uh, lens we've put forward here is car ownership. Not an educational metric, but access to opportunity. If you can get to a job, if you can uh, be mobile, we think that's a part of the access to opportunity here. And I'll show you a, um, a graph here in just a moment about vehicle tenure. But before going there, I wanted just to highlight a few of the other indicators that we wanted to include in the profile, because we think they speak to this issue of access to opportunity, um, but weren't able to because of the disaggregation issues. So parent education. That's a piece that the status and trends in, um, uh, in education for racial and ethnic uh, minorities uh, report emphasize. You know, we, we know in education, mother's education specifically often um, informs what's going on for children. Um, but we weren't able to get that data uh, disaggregated at the state level and for American Indians and Alaska Natives. So that's going on a list uh, that's going to the Department of Education, along with free and reduced price lunch, um, the number of percentage of students who um, have access to free and reduced price lunch, wanting to get that disaggregated further. Um, care, or uh, child care and after school, what's the proportion, a percentage of, of Native youth accessing that in terms of um, family access to opportunity. Uh, we'd love to get that disaggregated. Disability um, figures, veteran, uh, you know, looking at a um, broader population, the disability statistics, uh, trying to figure out how to present some of that information here and get access um, uh, to those. Financial aid, so thinking about higher education, being able to disaggregate some of that. And then teacher uh, experience, um, so looking at that as a measure of access to opportunity. So these are ones that are kind of on our wish list 
that we've identified through this that we'd love to um, be able to, to do some work with. Here's the, uh, one of the images, uh, this is uh, from Alaska specifically, around vehicles, um, uh, car uh, ownership vehicles available. And so you can see some of the differences here, um, American Indian Alaska Native to uh, white head of household, almost mirror image here, no vehicles available um, versus one uh, vehicle available, two vehicles, and then certainly three vehicles there. And then some of the differences um, by uh, geography with the um, Alaska Native Village statistical areas and rural being about the same, uh, urban having some more access, um, but still, um, still struggling here. Uh, where we drew uh, most of these data were from census again, ACS, as well as the US Department of Education, specifically the National Center for Education Statistics and Ed Data Express. So, you know, wanting to equip folks to be able to use some of these data and um, source some of this information for themselves there. System involvement, uh, the last of the, the three that will, or the four that we'll go through. Um, so this one here, we've got a range of indicators that we've um, brought together, native youth offending rates. What we found here was the offending rates um, were highest in Alaska and Montana. And there was actually an underrepresentation of what we would expect given the proportion of native youth in the overall New Mexico population. Property crime, so what, what, are, what are the offenses for? Uh, property crimes were more frequent in uh, the native cases and drug-related offenses in non-native offenders. So beginning to understand more about youth offending. This one probably one of the most interesting here, disproportion in the commitment rate. So beyond just the offending rate, how uh, juveniles and youth get committed um, to, uh, to institutions for their offenses. New Mexico has the highest commitment rate for uh, native youth offenders. So even though the number and the proportion is, is lowest, um, the, they are, when they are um, committed, they're committed at the highest rate. So the disparity was the highest uh, for native youth. So what we would expect native to non-native was highest. Um, in Montana, so maybe looking at, looking at a system issue as well there. And the disparity was the lowest for Native youth in Oklahoma, so there may be more of a fairness um, going on, which again may contribute to why we see um, somewhat better outcomes uh, for Native youth in Oklahoma. Child welfare, Alaska and Montana have much higher rates of Native youth in their foster care systems, while New Mexico and Oklahoma are at or below what we expect, again, as part of the story about what may be constraining um, the system and supporting Native youth and families, looking at their involvement from a very early age in Alaska and Montana specifically. Um, and I know that our colleagues at NICWA have really led up a lot of the charge um, in Alaska to, uh, to hold the state accountable um, for this as well as in other states like South Dakota and beyond. Adoption, Alaska has the highest and increasing uh, rates of adoption of Native youth. So this, again, kind of removal of children from the family um, plays into uh, what's going on for Native youth and families. More of a strengths indicator, family reunification. New Mexico and Montana are reunifying families at a high rate. So what's going on there? What has enabled, even though Montana struggles in terms of having um, very high rates of Native youth in their foster care systems, how are they moving forward with the reunification effort? And then we've got two school measures, school suspension. So Native youth experience severe disparities across the board, with those in Alaska having the highest rates and Oklahoma the lowest. So again, Oklahoma really coming through here. Um, in Montana, Native youth, so going further to geography on reservation, face significant discipline disparities. And then those with disabilities face the highest suspension rates across all four states. So it's something that we really keyed into about understanding how um, the disability label and uh, experiences of disabled youth um, are is really a concern. Oklahoma, however, seems to have more proportional outcomes. On the expulsion front, there's severe overrepresentation um, of Native youth being expelled in, all, expelled in all four states, with the rates in Montana and Oklahoma um, being the most surprising in terms of very, very high rates, even though they tend to be lower um, for the school suspension. So there's something going on with the expulsion piece that, and the system involvement and that um, link also between school to prison 
at the explosion level that uh, that really demands a focus. A couple of uh, just data displays here to go a little deeper. We've um, uh, our colleague Sarah Patolsky has coined this great term system entrapment to capture the dynamic in Montana. Native juvenile offenders were two times more likely to be committed for crimes against another person than their non-native counterparts. In Oklahoma, native juvenile offenders were more than two times more likely to be committed for drug offenses than their non-native counterparts. And then in New Mexico, despite accounting for less than 2% of all technical violations, 100% of native juvenile offenders were committed versus 70% of all others. So here we're seeing real severe system challenges um, with the juvenile justice system here. And then you see a data display about the school of expulsions point from the previous slide. American Indian Alaska Native is this pink um, line. So yeah, you see very high rates um, of expulsion, uh, even in Oklahoma, Montana, very, very high, 40% um, being expelled here. And this is from 2008, so older data, but the best that we can get, um, sorry, 2006 uh, report here. And then just a few um, other quick snapshots about uh, the disproportionality um, in the uh, foster care um, system, the disproportionality uh, index. And so you see the overrepresentation uh, for um, Alaska at the top left, uh, entries in care exits here as compared to pretty much all others, uh, slightly uh, higher here, uh, African American. Montana, pretty much the same story, although African Americans really are facing uh, overrepresentation here too. New Mexico though, there's something we may be able to learn from what's going on uh, for them in terms of the um, lack of uh, the lower disproportionality here and Oklahoma. So trying to identify places where there's um, good working systems that we can then leverage across. We drew across the broadest a uh, number of kind of sources here, census, U.S. Department of Education, several different resources here, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, OJJDP, um, National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, and then a range of state-specific data. Um, that's something that we'd really like to think about next steps. You know, we were really initially looking at federal data, um, but uh, because the issue is comparison, if we start sourcing state data heavily, you know, are they measuring uh, dropout the same? Are they measuring, um, you know, system involvement in the ways that we've talked about it in the same way across the states? That's where we get a little challenged in just relying um, heavily on state data. But again, a conversation um, there. And then just wrapping up, I know I'm pretty close to my time here. We have three um, quick slides about uh, the state-specific profile. So looking at Alaska, the story around system involvement, some aspects are that there are high rates of Native children in foster care being adopted out and suspended. So we have a problem with system involvement in some very specific ways in Alaska. Access to opportunity, Native people experience the greatest disparity in accessing a high school diploma or alternative uh, and the least disparity in having access to the internet. So there are some strengths there that we could build from. And then family economic capability, um, there's the highest disparity between the proportion of Native grandparents raising their grandchildren and all other grandparents. So there's a much higher uh, number of proportion of those in Alaska. And so that may um, feed into uh, some of these other areas um, uh, of challenge or of strength, uh, but that was one of the things that we zeroed in on. New Mexico, while Native youth commit a lower proportion of offenses than we would expect, they face severe disparities in incarceration. The state does seem committed, however, to family reunification, so there are some possibilities there. Native people experience the greatest disparity in uh, accessing a bachelor's degree and in having access to a computer. And then the greatest disparity between the proportion of Native and all other grandparents over 60 raising grandchildren. So we looked at this, it was uh, between 30 and 59 years old, the age of the grandparents, and then those over 60. And so we thought in New Mexico, you know, if they want to um, provide supports to Native families, looking at um, grandparents over the age of 60 may be one place to start. And then finally, Oklahoma. Um, what's going on here? Native youth experience the lowest rates of commitment for juvenile offenses, placement in foster care, and school suspension. There's some good things happening. However, there is a need for a focus on the disparity in expulsion. 
Access to opportunity, Native people experience less disparity in educational attainment. So we're seeing really, um, really similar patterns for Native people in uh, attainment, achievement, dropout, and graduation. Um, and then uh, Oklahoma has the second highest proportion of Native families with incomes below poverty. So poverty is not the only um, input that's contributing to these somewhat better outcomes. They still have the second highest of the four states proportion of Native families um, with incomes below poverty and the highest proportion of families led by women with no spouse present. So it's not just a matter also of who's present in the family composition. So there's, there's other things we may need to look at um, in Oklahoma that might be contributing in addition to um, looking at the poverty uh, data. So I know a lot of different ways of kind of cutting it, but hopefully you can see some of the storyline we're trying to get at. Just a few of the quick takeaways um, that we've uh, mentioned, the further need for state level disaggregation. There's more indicators that we think go into telling the story um, that we need access to, um, and certainly further need for strength-based indicators. Um, from some of the NICWA's work, uh, Annie Casey work to script as it were, um, but there's not a lot of existing data that really allow for that strengths-based analysis. So that's certainly something that we are um, continuing to prioritize on that front. So I will end there. And uh, again, if you have questions, um, you can type them into the uh, question box or raise your hand and we can unmute you. Or we're happy to unmute you even if you want to type into the box. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes um, for questions about this presentation or other things that have occurred to you uh, from the NICWA presentation. And then we'll, uh, we have about 15 minutes um, saved for kind of an overarching concluding discussion. So I see a couple of questions here, and just one. So um, Ron says, as in Oklahoma, we're looking forward to your email with for the resources and a recording of this webinar. As an Oklahoma Kids Count Director, I'll definitely be implementing this information. Also, please provide info on the conference mentioned. Thank you. OK, so just uh, some comments. And I think she's had to sign off here. But I'll stop talking and see if there's any questions. No worries if there's not. I know that was a, a lot of different kinds of information, but uh, we can go ahead. Uh, oh, we just got James says, um, any suggestions for sources for beyond those listed for urban Indian data? Um, great question, James. I'll ask if uh, you know my colleagues, uh, Amber um, or Jen, yourself, if you have any thoughts. I think uh, for myself, um, it, it's really the geography disaggregation. You saw uh, some of that in a few of the slides, um, how you cut the data uh, that we've been looking at. Um, uh, but no, not off the top of my head, specific um, resources just for um, urban Indian data. We've had a partnership over the years with the National um, Council on Urban Indian Health, NICUI. Uh, former director Jamie Bartkus is now out in Oklahoma. And she's um, a part of a lot of our conversations. And so we, we talk and, and try to prioritize that. I think some of the urban Indian health um, clinical data is one of the ways we've been trying to partner around some of that. Um, and Carolyn, I, I see that you're on. I don't know if, um, if any of you folks have any other thoughts on that front. This is Sarah. And um, just you know, as far as if you were to try to target some of the larger Cities that you know there would be a greater proportion of you know American Indian Alaska natives within the general population. Um, you can kind of narrow in on um, you know Albuquerque, Anchorage, some of these other cities, and um, find some data 
where AIAN is represented. Um, that was one thing I was starting to pull for juvenile offending patterns, looking at the Anchorage Police Department and seeing how some of those cases were being processed. So um, that's certainly one approach is kind of picking some of the top line um, states where we know there would be greater representation. City. So even I was just going to add that. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Jen. I was just going to add that that in Portland we have a, a very unique resource. There's an organization called the Coalition of Communities of Color, uh, and their mission is um, focused on advancing racial justice through cross-cultural collective action. So they've been they've done a lot of work around um, highlighting. Uh, health disparities not only in the urban American Indian community here in Portland, but also uh, the black community, the Asian community, uh, the Latino community. So um, I know it's specific to Portland, uh, but I think it represents a very unique resource, and I hope that um, there are there will be other resources like it. Uh, but I encourage you to look them up, and I'm happy to to share that resource with you as well. Great. And Carolyn, I have unmuted you, but uh, I don't want to put you on the spot too much. So just to let you know if you had any thoughts on the urban Indian health data at all. Thank you, Malia. Can you hear me? And Malia, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I was just going to actually echo um, Sarah's comment that um, given the areas that um, that we find urban Indian populations at, at the highest levels, I think that those would probably be the areas where um, you would want to pursue some of these statistics. Um, also, I'm not, I'm not sure that um, the Office of Minority Health in terms of health statistics might be a place to look, um, but, but that did occur to me that that would possibly be a source as well, be, given the fact that uh, urban Indians um, might be looked at more as a minority pro population rather than as a tribal and, and government um, connected population. Great. And I think that's a really good note, and I'm making note of it from both you and Sarah about, um, you know, we talked about uh, using state data in some of these profiles and looking at those top 10 states over time, but um, now I'm, you know, I'm definitely taking note and thinking about the city and urban level where we do have high concentrations as a further level of, of trying to build some of these comparisons out. So that's really helpful. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, click to our um, last kind of slide here uh, with some of the questions that we'd um, come together to brainstorm around for this kind of final discussion portion where we'd really love to just hear more from you you know, certainly about the presentations, but more about your work and things that you think it's important for us to be thinking about as we prepare these resources, finalizing them, um, and to think about dissemination and how we can engage with users that we, we hope are, are you. Um, so some of the things that we wanted to, to just open up the line to hear from you is, did anything in these presentations surprise you? Um, would you use these resources in your current work? Um, what kind of support would you need to use resources like these? What kinds of tools, what kinds of training, what types of information? I heard already you know, more engagement with uh, tribes and, and tribal data users. What would you like to see come next in this project? Um, and then kind of more secondarily, but also important, are there other needs uh, in your work to improve American Indian Alaska Native data that you want to make us aware of that we can think about building towards um, and also, who do you think about as the users of American Indian Alaska Native data? Uh, who are they that you know of? I'll say on that point that we've talked a little bit um, at NCAI uh, with our tribal data quarterly teleconferences. We've seen increasingly tribal data planners, or tribal planners, excuse me, those who have a responsibility at a departmental level to use economic data for forecasting, to use demographic data for building plans around services. 
at service area population. And so they are increasingly those that come to our data meetings or that are partnered with us on some of our data projects. And so that's one community that we're trying to, to help network and to think with about how we can tailor our resources to be useful. Connected to those are certainly those who are in the development offices of, of tribes, those writing grants and trying to uh, amass data to be able to tell their story, to generate a need, um, to demonstrate the needs that they have, or to gauge the impact of investment in their community and to, to talk with funders and um, you know, federal agencies, state agencies, about the value of investing in American and Alaska Native um, communities. So those are a few of the, the users that we talk and think a lot about. But if there are others um, that you folks want to, you know, tribal epicenter directors uh, are another just off the top of, of our head here. Um, so we'll go ahead. I'll go ahead and uh, see if they're open that up to see if you'd like to just share any reflections with us um, about your work and in connection to helping us think about this project. Right, so we have a question from Karen Olson. And let's see. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Karen. Karen, are you yes, there? Hi. Yes, I am. Um, I, some of the issues that we're dealing with right now is trying to um, we're we're. we're Within North Dakota, our, our non-white populations tend to be very small. And so reporting any kind of data, we run into a lot of suppression issues. And so we were thinking about how best to get at some of these data, especially after the race to results report came out, focusing on the strength-based indicators. And because we typically report on a geography-based, uh, which is a county-based, we thought, well, let's focus on reservations. and we know that there needs to be a lot of work yet in terms of, of getting some of the stakeholder support from, from tribal communities in the state, but a lot of the feedback we're getting isn't necessarily positive in terms of reporting on the, on the reservation level. Um, there's a lot of questions about who owns the data, um, how is it being presented, how is it being used, and so while there are users out there who want it and which is how this sprang up we're getting you know feedback from tribal communities saying yes this is very important to information to have we're also facing a lot of pushback saying you know this isn't this isn't the best approach and so we're we're in we're in that process now we're trying to work with with individuals to make sure that it it's um a good approach, but I, I just I'm just curious uh, in terms of the the data that you presented. You looked at urban and rural AIA and populations, and I'm wondering if you've ever looked at specific data to, data specific to reservations themselves. Mm -hmm. Amber, I don't know if you want to speak to that the reservation level data specifically, and I can I'm happy to talk to uh, some of the challenges around the reporting if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is Amber, and I work with, a lot with the geography questions. And um, 
it's true um, that I, I, I like the question you have about how to work with tribes about um, the uh, what's happening in their own communities. I think there are two separate issues involved in this question. There's, I think that there's the first part, which is how good is the data that's available for reservation areas, and that's its own issue depending on the size of the the uh, population and the size of the reservation. Um, the larger it is, the better the data. But in in Alaska and some of the un, um, Great Plains states, the tribal geographies are very small and so it's difficult to get uh, at, at least using census data very good um, data for one reservation area but uh, even if you can get good uh, data for a reservation area um, what is the relationship with the tribes in, in analyzing it and releasing it and I think that the um, We've done a lot of our work at the request of our um, NCI board. So there's a request from a specific, there's a specific need identified about learning about Indian country and NCI's regions and um, how, just what is the status of things for our board members to um, become better, um, better advocates for all of Indian country instead of their own region. Um, but then looking at a state level, um, and specific reservation indicators, I think that could have um, that could raise questions from specific tribal leaders that might vary from tribe to tribe. And um, I, I, the the work that Malia has done in the, our policy research center on um, re doing good research in Indian country speaks to some of this. Uh, but I think having a good relationship with the tribal leaders and and your state is really important and. But it sounds like you've you've started doing a lot of that. But those are the two different issues, and the reason we we look at we or at least in our regional profiles we looked at uh, rural versus urban versus reservation. Um, well, uh, Alaska Native villages or reservation level is because the data are a little better uh, when you aggregate it into categories instead of specific places because our populations are so small and spread out across different areas in the state that it, it just is um, smaller margins of errors if we look at all urban American Indians, all rural American Indians, and they're, they're having very different experiences. And, and I would just add, absolutely, I think, you know, I would encourage, I would really love, um, Karen, for you to um, if you have a chance to take a look at our regional profile um, for the Plains and uh, talk with us a little bit about, um, you know, whether you see some of that as, as useful. Um, because our hope is that with those regional profiles and then some of the ones that we're developing, um, building on that work, that those are things that um, advocates and, and data um, leaders like yourself in regions can take to the tribes can take to other data users and say, you know, here's some of what's possible, you know, with these, and it sounds like you've talked and, you know, some of the tribes that you're working with have seen the value in some of the analysis, um, but then it is, it, that is the work of then, you know, really working through what some of those fears are, um, you know, what some of those uh, data sharing agreements will look like, because we do know, um, you know, the, the stigma and the harm that, um, sharing tribal level data without, you know, adequate consultation and permissions, you know, has had generational impacts. And so that, you know, that's what Amber's speaking to is that certainly our work is around um, data analysis and, and data dissemination, but always hand in hand with the partnership and the, the governance aspects um, of the work because it's, it's pretty critical. Um, we've worked with some scholars, for instance, actually in the Plains region, um, who had some really uh, great data that they developed uh, that we knew would be of, of service, you know, to Indian country, and they wanted to, you know, disseminate it, but they came to us with a concern saying, you know, we're really worried about how this may be taken, um, you know, and, and affect some of the tribes who are included by us releasing tribal level uh, data on this, um, on this particular topic. And one of the things we talked with them about was how do we use technology, you know, just the burden as, as they were framing it, of getting all of the permissions and, and their timeline that they were looking at. How do we use technology and communications in a way, um, you know, to to expedite um, some of the permissions to, you know, give tribes access to their data 
um, in, in a way electronically so that they can, you know, you can equip them there, but then also solicit their permission for this broader um, disaggregation. We do think the permissions are really important. We've seen it uh, work in some ways in Alaska. Um, several of us are Alaska Native on the team, so you'll hear a few examples from Alaska. Um, but there, uh, we worked as part of a project um, called the um, Alaska Native Student Vitality uh, Work um, and the Alaska um, Native Education Indicators Project to develop data using um, what are called Alaska uh, Native uh, Claim Settlement Act regions, more related to political geographies as opposed to just um, uh, reservation or, or uh, village level data. So a little bit more aggregated um, to protect uh, some of the data that way and presented it back in the regions and a lot of the tribes and villages again began to see the value of this work and support um, an institute called the First Alaskans Institute and the Alaska Native Policy Center to generate more of this um, of this work because they saw that. So I guess that's all to say you know, looking at community institutions um, and partnership to help build some of that momentum. But we'd love to, you know, be in conversation with you because I think, as you mentioned, there's several communities and, and regions facing this challenge of um, small population measurement and reporting um, in an ethical and a Great, thank you. Just as a, a quick follow-up, do you know whether or not there was there's been any type of agreement between the Census Bureau and tribes when they release their information at the reservation level or at the tribe level? Amber, do you want to speak to that at all? We can talk a little bit about some of our NSF work on that front, but to my knowledge, no, I don't know of anything specific. Well, there isn't, um, that's an interesting question. There's There are a number of consultations the Census Bureau has undertaken in the lead up to 2000 and 2010, and there's a round of consultations right now as well, um, uh, that where travel leaders are discussing some of these issues more. Actually, they are discussing the topic of um, some of the race categories and a, this new experiment about collecting um, tribal enrollment data instead of just American Indian and Alaska Native as a race. And that's a little controversial. There's not any consensus in Indian country on having the Census Bureau be the place that collects that information and shares it. But mm -hmm. um, there is also um, not a, there. I, that's an interesting question because all of the data that we would be sharing is census data. But it, even though it's public information, um, and even though um, it's you know it's it's legit in all the uh, traditional ways to release it publicly, there's still some sensitivity about what's released at the tribal level, even though anybody could go to FactFinder and, and look up the information. It's just a matter of framing, I think, and having some um, buy-in from uh, uh, tribal leaders about what the proposed recommendations might be from, um, if, if you're using tribal level data in a report, what what are the recommendations for improving those situations? And so that's kind of the thought I would have on that. Thank you. The challenge, too, also on that front with the census data, right, is that it is collected at an individual level and aggregated to a tribal level uh, where, where possible. Um, but it, you know, it's very challenged in that way. Um, we actually don't have a mechanism in this country for tribal level data collection kind of nationally. That was something that was required of the Department of the Interior in what's called the American Indian Population and Labor Force Report. But increasingly in this last iteration, they uh, shifted to use it from using tribal level self-reporting data to using census data, um, which we've taken issue with because it's not tribal level data. It's individual level aggregated. So. That's where we also get into this issue. And, and we're working um, with a small number of tribes as well as with um, through the National Science Foundation to build some tribal data capacity around tribal level enumeration and measurement because we see that as, as really severely lacking. Um, and we're missing out a lot of the, the, the realities facing tribes, like I mentioned, joblessness earlier in some of the measurement pieces. That, that is a is a long-term project, though, and something that's going to, you know, not going to provide resources immediately, so. Oh. 
All right. Well, we have a few more minutes that we've kind of allotted. Um, I don't see any more questions. Uh, we can wait a few more minutes. Um, but in the meantime, just wanting to thank everybody um, for engaging with us around this. And as we said, we will be sending out um, the link uh, to this audio in case it's of use to you um, and anyone else in your network. And we'll send along some information on a few of the resources that we've mentioned. Um, Jen, I think you mentioned the National uh, Hawaiian or the Native Hawaiian Educational Assessment, for instance. We mentioned our First Kids First uh, Children's Agenda. Our Tribal Leader Scholar Forum, somebody asked in one of the questions for that conference information, um, and, and the Tribal Data Teleconference as well that we can send along. Um, and we put, we embedded, at least in our presentation, a few links, um, but we'll include those as well uh, to our regional profiles. And would love for you folks to have a look at those products that will inform um, the final versions of, of what we're going to be releasing with this. Um, but we'd love to be in touch and, and in connection with you. Uh, because these are really priority issues for, for us as organizations, and now uh, we see you as, as real critical partners in this. So again, big thank you to the Annie EKC Foundation for funding this work and for providing uh, opportunity for us to engage um, as pointy heads, as the nerds, as the geeks, <laughs> as we refer to ourselves um, in this work uh, to ensure the best outcomes for our children and our families in this. So unless there's any further questions, I think we'll go ahead and uh, finish up. And thank you, folks, and look forward to connecting with you all uh, down the, the pathway here. So have a good one. Take care out there.